Good morning to all of the attendees participating from Europe. Good afternoon to those of you connecting from China. I am David Orlandi, your partnership manager, and I will be uh, guiding you throughout uh, today's webinar, How to Export to China via e-commerce, which we are hosting in cooperation with the uh, Slovenian Chinese uh, Business Council. And to this end, I would like to briefly give the floor to Tinker Godek from this institution for any uh, welcoming words. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Davide. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to co-organize uh, this uh, webinar together with the EU SME Center. First, thank you very much uh, in su supporting, well, uh, in, 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 in your partnership with us. I'm very much looking forward to, um, to the content on this, of this uh, webinar. Um, just a few short words about the Slovenian Chinese Business Council. We are established within the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Slovenia. Uh, we um, are mostly representing or combining companies, uh, either Chinese companies in Slovenia or Slovenian companies that uh, are present in the Chinese market. Uh, we support them through matchmaking, through knowledge sharing, um, uh, through also uh, organizing delegations, uh, either incoming or outcoming delegations, uh, through relationships with institutions in Slovenia and in China. Uh, last week, we just had the pleasure of co hosting the uh, China Council for the Promotion of International Trade at our institution. Um, so we try to support Slovenian businesses that uh, are going to China. And uh, exactly the next opportunity will be in November when we have uh, two big delegations coming up, one with the Minister of the Economy, Tourism and Sport to the China International Import Expo, and one with the Minister of agriculture. Um, essentially, uh, we hope to help Slovenian companies in any way we can uh, when it comes to their business in China, either through uh, helping them in um, due diligence, in connecting with proper institutions, good business partners, or through supporting them in knowledge, uh, like in today's uh, seminar. Um, that's it from my side. If you have any further questions, you can contact us. Uh, our contact is public on our website. Um, as I said previously, I'm really looking forward to this webinar and I would give the floor back to David. Thank you very much, Tinkara. And moving on with uh, today's uh, agenda, I would like to uh, briefly mention that uh, our main uh, keynote speech today uh, provided by uh, Alessio Pedino, Business Advisor for USME Center, will of course focus on uh, the opportunities and the challenges that European uh, small and medium enterprises face for what concerns uh, uh, export to China via cross-border commerce. Uh, of course, this is an extremely relevant uh, instrument for uh, European SMEs, but there are various caveats uh, that uh, we must be cautious of. So to this end, uh, we are going to focus also on uh, examples and case studies from European small and medium enterprises. I would like to briefly mention that uh, we have the opportunity of making it a, a bit more of an interactive session today, uh, since we don't have uh, that many participants. So also throughout the, uh, the keynote speech, please feel free to uh, write down your questions in the Q&A section inside the Zoom platform. Uh, before leaving the floor to our main speaker, I would like, however, to briefly present USME Center. Uh, we are a European Union funded project under the European Commission and ASMA in uh, more in detail. Uh, this project has been ongoing ever since 2010, so this is currently the 14th year of life uh, of this activity. And the uh, core goal uh, of this action is that of supporting European small and medium enterprises that want to access the Chinese market. In order to do so, we've devised uh, five core services that we offer free of charge to all EU-based uh, enterprises, as well as to enterprises based in uh, single market participating countries. Uh, the first one is the self-diagnosis tool, which is a quiz that you can take simply by logging in into our website. Uh, and this would allow, will allow you to understand if you have any knowledge gap for what concerns the Chinese market. Should that be the case, the uh, website will redirect you to the knowledge component which uh, you can think of as a database of all the various reports, uh, guidelines, all the documents that we've published and kept up to date uh, in the past uh, 14 years. There are 350 plus documents that can be accessible 
and they range from uh, general introductions to the Chinese market up until very specific and in-depth analysis of the various sectors of the Chinese economy. Uh, the third component is the advice one. So uh, should you not find all the information that you uh, need through the first two services, you have the chance to ask questions confidentially and free of charge to our experts. Uh, you can directly reach out to them through our website and they will uh, provide punctual replies to your queries. The first service is the training one, uh, which consists in uh, uh, online training or in-person training, such as the one that we are hosting uh, here today. Uh, here as well, we can range from general assessments of the Chinese market, but also we can go more in detail, more in depth about specific issues that could be of interest for a specific member state or a specific organization. The fifth service is the advocacy one. This is mainly uh, targeted at those enterprises that are already in the Chinese market. And the goal here is that of making sure that any issues, any problems that these enterprises face can be collected so as to provide a coherent voice to European small and medium enterprises at the governmental level in China. Uh, before moving forward and giving the floor to the speaker, I would like to stress that uh, we have a survey at the end of this uh, event. For us, your feedback is extremely important so that we can learn how to better tailor our services, uh, what kind of content to provide, how to make sure that uh, the events, that the activities that you carry out are of uh, relevance for you and for uh, your entities. So please, at the end of the uh, web, uh, at the end of the webinar, please make sure to fill out our survey. And now, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Alessio Pino, Business Advisor for USME Center. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, our activities, uh, I'm sure you already know him. Uh, he's been working for uh, USME Center's Business Advisor for more than uh, eight years. Uh, very extensive uh, knowledge on the Chinese market and uh, on cross-border e-commerce, which is the topic of uh, today's activity. Uh, thank you very much, Alessio, and uh, I'll leave, leave you the floor. Thank you, Davide. Thank you, Tinkara. It is a great pleasure to participate in this webinar today on this uh, very interesting topic, which um, is very relevant for, for SMEs in, in many sectors. So uh, my presentation, oh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, pretty much everything I'm going to say in, in the presentation today um, is actually uh, can be found in a report uh ad hoc report on cross-border e-commerce that we did last year there are also other case studies so everything um pretty much everything i'm going to say you will find in more detail in this report which again is is for free you don't have to pay for anything you can just scan the code and download it from our website the only thing is that you have to register an account first if you haven't already if you haven't, I, I recommend you to do so because we have a lot of reports, a lot of uh, resources that are all free and, and they're waited, waiting to be downloaded. So I will first, I will talk about four main points. Uh, the first will be a general overview of the ways to enter the Chinese market and this to basically to explain why cross-border e-commerce is relevant. Then uh, we will uh, go in detail um, to see how cross-border e-commerce works. Um, then we will see some of the, what are the main platforms, because we will see that cross-border e-commerce um, has a lot of potential, but is very limited to a certain um, number of platforms. So we will go uh, look into these platforms in detail. And then last time we have some some points, some some, some, some tips, some recommendations um, for any uh, European, Slovenian SMEs that want to approach uh, cross-border commerce. So as for the first point, um, I would like to start in this way because um, by giving a general overview of how uh, the market works, we understand why cross-border commerce is relevant. So there are two main ways. It's not just two actually, but but uh, I would say the most common ones for, for SMEs are two, which is First is general trade, uh, which is the normal, let's say, way of, of doing business. But usually you have an importer in China, you have a distributor, an agent, and then you sell your products. Uh, you ship your products to China and then distributors sell them to different channels, offline, online, uh, to restaurants, shops, and so on. Um, and then there is another way is cross-border e-commerce, which, um, which works a little bit different. Um, 
each way has uh, advantages as pros and cons. Each way requires different levels of resources, commitment, and time. Um, and I would like to say that a uh, general trade uh, can be done simultaneously with cross-border e-commerce um, in principle. Uh, it doesn't exclude cross-border e-commerce, but the opposite is not always true, meaning that uh, we will see in the next slides, um, meaning that uh, sometimes some products can only be sold by a cross-border e-commerce. They cannot be sold by general trade. While well, maybe a product that can be sold by general trade can also be sold by cross-border e-commerce. So um, to give an overview of how the two, these two ways uh, differ uh, and what are their, their uh, features, we will start with general trade. Uh, in general, um, to sell a product by general trade, you have to do different things. You have to are different steps. Uh, the first one, not for all, uh, Product categories, but but especially for food products, um, there might need to be a government agreement in place between China and your country uh, of origin. Uh, this is especially the case for food and beverage products, for meat, dairy, um, aquatic products, fruits and vegetables, and uh, and and this kind of um, let's say products which have more um, higher food safety risks. Let's say. Um, you need to have this protocol. If there is no such protocol, you just cannot export via trade, via, via general trade. So, so that's uh, that's easy. You cannot do anything. But you may be able to export via cross-border e-commerce, and we will see uh, later. Um, then, if you are eligible, if there is a, an agreement in place between your country and China, then you might need to register your product in advance. Um, again, it's not uh, always the case for all products, but um, but but most products require you to register the product in advance, and this applies to food and beverage, but also apply to machinery, cosmetics, uh, medical devices. Apply to different um, products. You might need to get a certification. You might need to do testing and and so on. Um, then you might also need to register your facility, your production facility. Again, this is uh, very common for food and beverage, but not only food and beverage. Um, and then um, on top of this, you also have to make sure that um, during this process, you, you comply with Chinese standards, um, which usually are aligned with international standards, but not always. Uh, you should comply with Chinese standards, also with Chinese uh, labels and packaging standards. So, so this is uh, these are the steps, the requirements for general trade. Now, cross-border e-commerce, why is, is interesting? It's because... Uh, Everything I've just said for general trade doesn't apply for cross-border e-commerce. You don't have to do any of this. So um, uh, you, you, it's it's very attractive because uh, yeah, you don't have any, you don't have to do anything of what I've just said. Uh, you just need to ensure that your product is included in a list, in a dedicated list. It's called cross-border e-commerce positive list. Uh, you have to make sure that your product is there. Currently, there are more than 1,400 1, items on this list, and most food and beverage products are on the list, by the way. Uh, also, some frozen seafood and meats and, and vegetables and so on. So uh, this is the only thing you have to do. Um, and then um, we will see later, there are also different shipping modes. Uh, you can ship directly from your country. You can also uh, store your goods in, in a warehouse, in a free trade zone in China. We will see later in more, more of these logistics aspects. Um, once you ensure that your product is on this list, uh, you have to, uh, all you have to do is to open a store, an online store and e-shop on one of these cross-border uh, e-commerce platforms. Um, and then you are done. You are settled. You you can just go ahead and sell your product. It's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it could take uh, opening a store could take a couple of weeks. Uh, of course, then there is the design part. You have to make sure that the store looks nice, is attractive. But uh, the hard requirements are 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 pretty easy and, and only take maybe a couple of weeks. So so um, to make a general. Um, the the thing with cross border e-commerce, of course, is very is very attractive as because you don't have to do any of those um you know long and time consuming approval procedures. There are some negatives, some cons, which means that you can only sell your product through certain platforms. You cannot sell it uh, anywhere. 
um, for instance, you cannot sell products uh, on through offline channels. So meaning that if uh, you sell through cross-border commerce, your product cannot be put in in uh, cannot be sold in uh, supermarkets or or um, uh, restaurants or uh, you know offline stores. Only can only be sold on on certain platforms. While general trade, you can sell it wherever you want. Um, uh, in terms of logistics, cross-border commerce is mostly for B two C. Uh, is to sell directly to consumers while general trade you can go ever uh, you can sell it to b2b b2c b2b2c you can you can um, sell it to whoever you want and then you can also store it wherever you want you can also store your products in 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 your apartment if you live in china you can have your product stored in your apartment of course if you uh, feasible but uh, with cross-border commerce you can't you the products must be stored in certain um bonded zones we will see later the logistics aspect Time and resources wise, um, general trade is longer, uh, it's more difficult because of all the requirements that I mentioned before. You need to have a protocol sometimes in place between your country and China. You need to register your product. You need to, sometimes you register your facility. You, you might need to have your product tested, uh, certified. This can take a lot. There are some products which uh, might require one year, two years. Uh, for instance, cosmetics is, is pretty difficult. Uh, uh, it takes a lot uh, of time and also money to register a cosmetic product. While cross-border e-commerce, you don't need to do any of this. So basically, it's very short. You just need to open a store or find a partner which already has a store, and then you can virtually sell your product tomorrow. Um, and then in terms of standards, um, with general trade, you have to comply with Chinese standards for labels, packaging, and um, safety, product safety. And, and so on, while for cross-border e-commerce, you don't have to do any of this because cross-border e-commerce are, products sold via cross-border e-commerce are considered personal goods sold directly to consumers and, and you can use the original labels and the original packaging. You don't have to change anything. So um, this is a visual, visual um, let's say, comparison of general trade, which you find on the left and cross-border e-commerce. It's, it's a bit detailed, but I just want to highlight three points. The first one is that for general trade, before you can do anything, you have to complete product registration, facility registration, a lot of procedures. So uh, this is before you can um, you're allowed to 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 sell your product to China. Cross border commerce, you just need to open a store on a certain platform. That's it. Or 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 again, find a partner which has a store already on one of these platforms, and then you put your products in their store. The second aspect I would like to highlight is the customs clearance. So usually with general trade, uh, the products are clear, are cleared by the Chinese customs as soon as they arrive to the port in China. Products are at the port and then importer submits all the documents um, and then the products are cleared. With cross-border e-commerce, it doesn't work this way. Um, unless you ship directly um, your products from, your, from Slovenia to, to China, um, uh, in this case, of course, products are, are cleared immediately as soon as they arrive in China. But there is also another way with cross-border e-commerce is that you can ship your products to China, store them in a bonded zone, in a free trade zone, and have them there. Um, the products are not clear. Say the, so they don't enter the customs territory of China, let's say. They're on the Chinese territory, but not in the customs supervision. Uh, outside, they're outside the customs supervision um, um, area. Um, so you store them there, and then once a consumer makes an order on one of these cross-border e-commerce platforms, then the product uh, leaves the bonded zone and is cleared by the custom. So this 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 is good because it allows the product to be already present in China. So the delivery time from once the consumers make the order online to when they, re they receive the product is very short. Otherwise, if you had to ship from Slovenia to China, it, it might take uh, a while. So um, so, so if, if the products are stored in a bonded zone, they're not cleared by the custom. They're clear, the only ones uh, an order is made. And this is very, this is, is very important. And, and, and as I mentioned before, the third aspect is that with general trade, you can sell through via, through, through um, any uh, sales channels, offline channels, also traditional e-commerce platform. E Cross-border e-commerce, I would like to mention that is different from traditional e-commerce. Cross-border e-commerce is a part of e-commerce. Um, it's a very specific part of e-commerce, but then 
but then there are also other uh, general e-commerce platforms uh, which are not cross-border e-commerce platforms. Uh, for instance, um, I'm a restaurant manager. I sell uh, some products uh, in my restaurants. I also want to reach out to more clients. So I also create a store on a normal e-commerce platform and I put the products which I normally sell in the restaurants uh, on the e-commerce platforms and then sell them there. This is not cross-border e-commerce because the products are uh, um, enter China via general trade. And then you can sell to any channel, but cross-border e-commerce doesn't work this way. If I'm a restaurant manager, I cannot sell my products um, um, imported into China by cross-border e-commerce through any e-commerce platforms or in my restaurant. We, we will see more examples of this in the next slide. So uh, it's maybe, maybe it sounds a bit confusing now, but um, so, so to, to to be more practical, um, because I mentioned cross-border e-commerce doesn't uh, doesn't require you to register your product in advance. It doesn't require you to follow Chinese standards. So it is most suitable for those products which um, have these requirements uh, for general trade. So cosmetics, I mentioned health food, uh, food supplements, um, but also um, if, if you export a high-risk food product like a meat or seafood, uh, which you cannot export by general trade because there is no government protocol between your country and China, then maybe you can sell it through cross-border e-commerce. So cross-border e-commerce is most suitable for these product categories, product categories that would normally require a lot of uh, paperwork, a lot of testing, a lot of certification uh, to be uh, to be allowed to be sold to China. If a product uh, like wine, for instance, uh, or, or or some spirits, these products are very easy to sell via general trade because you don't need to do um, product registration. You, you need to register your facility, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. So, so for products which to be uh, for which general trade is easy, then cross-border e-commerce is not that um, meaningful because because it limits your sales channel and and and. Um, yeah, so 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 for these products, um, general trade uh, maybe might be a better option, or maybe the two things simultaneously. So a question that we often get is, okay, so so which way is better, general trade or cross-border e-commerce? Of course, you're welcome to if you have thoughts, you're welcome to uh, write comments in the chat or or uh, to share your thoughts in in the Q and A box. But the, the simple. The truth is that there is no answer to this, no no easy answer to this question. Of course, each one has uh, is more suitable for certain products, as I mentioned, uh, and um, while maybe not that suitable for for other products, um, they also require different uh, resources. Uh, if you have to register a cosmetic, for instance, it takes a lot of money for testing for. For um for having it registered, while um maybe cross border e-commerce doesn't need all that money, but still um do cross border e-commerce well it also requires a lot of money and, uh, because you need to do a lot of marketing, and um and the other thing is that general trade is maybe uh, I would say maybe a step ahead cross border e-commerce because it requires you um a deeper knowledge of the chinese market it requires you to have a solid a more solid network of partners in china um so so a typical way um for european smes is to use cross border e-commerce as a first step to to test a product in the chinese market to gain some feedback to to gain some initial feedback to see if a product could eventually work in the meantime maybe uh, you start the procedures, the paperwork for registering this product um, and, and export it through general trade. And um, and then in the second step, once you have completed this paperwork, then you switch to general trade. So, so cross-border e-commerce uh, is usually a good uh, first step. Um, of course, not always uh, there is this uh, this switch from cross-border e-commerce to general trade, but, but often, but they're often. Um, so this was a, a very general overview of why cross-border e-commerce is relevant. Now we get more technical uh, and we see how it works uh, in practice. So I mentioned uh, from, from the logistics perspective, cross-border e-commerce has two main models. Uh, the first one is to ship directly a product uh, from, from your country, from Slovenia, 
Um, of course, you still need to have your product um, available in a store, in a cross-border e-commerce platform. Um, there is also the issue of whether you can sell through your own website hosted uh, in Slovenia or abroad. This is a bit more complex, uh, a bit more gray area, but uh, you can. Um, in any case, um, you you in, in, in with this direct shipment mode, you sell you ship your product directly to China, typically by uh, by plane, uh, because it it doesn't take you three or four months. Maybe it takes you one week. Um, and then um, this is the typical one: the product arrives in China, is cleared by the customs, and then it's delivered to the customers uh, via domestic logistics. Um, this uh, is a bit, uh, let's say this is the most basic one uh, because it's the easiest one because you don't have to have uh, warehouses in China. You don't have to have, uh, you know, a lot of things that um, you would require in, in or otherwise. And um, of course the caveat is that deliver a product from your country to China might take a while. And when Chinese uh, consumers purchase on e-commerce, they usually want to receive the product, they expect to receive the product very soon. If you if they have to wait more than two days uh, or three days, then they maybe might not buy it, might buy an alternative product. So, so to overcome this issue, there is another model for cross-border e-commerce, it's called bonded import. So you don't need to wait a consumer to make an order on the cross-border e-commerce platform to ship uh, in order to ship your product. You can ship your product anytime um into into a bonded zone in, in China uh and have it uh, in, in a warehouse there of course you need to have this warehouse you need to either lease it directly if, if you have uh, more resources but you can also find a partner which does it for you you basically they um yeah they outsource this uh, logistics management warehouse management service to you so you don't necessarily need to do it directly you may do it directly if but it's more complicated uh possible uh, but uh, maybe it's it's more uh, next level, let's say. In any case, um, in this way, you ship your products, you store them in the bonded zone, and then uh, they're there. When a Chinese consumer makes an order on a cross-border e-commerce platform for this product, the product um, is uh, exits this bonded uh, zone, this warehouse immediately, and it's cleared by the customs then, and then it's delivered to the logistic, to domestic logistics, to the final consumers. And this is pretty much the same as domestic products. They are delivered to the final consumers within one or two or three days, depending on, on the city where, where the warehouse is and the, and the consumer is, but it's, it's, it's basically the same as domestic uh, products. So this is very attractive, of course, because um, um, you can also sell larger volumes because if you have a lot of products stored there uh, in, in a warehouse, you know, you can sell more while if you, if you have to ship the product every time one by one by plane uh, to, to China, of course, it can only work with uh, very small um, volumes. And and with bonded zone, you also have higher margins. But of course, it's more expensive um, because you need to have a warehouse either uh, lease uh, managed by yourself or by a partner, but, but it costs, it does cost, obviously. And um, now the only the other thing is that there are some products which for which you cannot choose the two models. Maybe you are forced to choose this bonded import model. You cannot ship directly from your country. You have to use the second, uh, the bonded import mode. These products, for instance, are OTC drugs. There are some, some OTC drugs, not all OTC drugs, but some OTC drugs. Um, also some maybe frozen seafood, frozen meats, or this kind of higher uh, fruits, vegetables, higher risk uh, food categories also require this second model. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned that um, a key requirement is that uh, in order to sell by cross-border commerce is that your product is listed on this, um, this catalog, this positive list. To date, there are more than 1,400 items on the list, which cover most categories of consumer goods, um, including some which uh, normally have very strict market entry requirements, such as health food, cosmetics, OTC drugs, I mentioned. Uh, these products are on the cross-border commerce list, so they can be sold in this way. Um, here is, is an example. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the report that we did last year on cross-border commerce. 
this report is very good because at the end we have a translation in English of uh, this uh, cross-border e-commerce list. Uh, all the 1,467 items are there for you and they're sorted by HS code. So it's very convenient for you to, to check whether your product um, is there or not. And you see in the last column here, um, it, it specify whether that product is needs to follow the bonded import model or not. If it's specified online shopping bonded goods only, then yes. Otherwise, you can choose any way uh, that you prefer. So um, this is just an example. Of course, the full list is there. I invite you to, to um to, to access the report. Uh, if a product is not on this list, uh, then uh, then you just cannot use cross-border e-commerce. Cross-border e-commerce doesn't apply for you. You can leave this webinar today. You can go, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but um, cross-border e-commerce doesn't, doesn't work. You 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 must uh, do general trade only. You don't have other options. So, um, but for, but most uh, consumer goods are there. So, so, so don't worry. Um, uh, another thing, um, another maybe limit uh, of cross-border e-commerce is that uh, there are annual limits um, that each Chinese consumer have for, for purchasing cross-border e-commerce. So it means that you cannot just buy uh, how much you like of cross-border e-commerce. We will see in the next slide, cross-border e-commerce products have a preferential tax rate in China. For this reason, you can just buy as much as you want. There is an annual quota for each consumer. The annual quota is 26,000 RMB, which is a bit more than 3,000 euros. So every person in China has this quota every year. Every year, they cannot exceed 26,000 RMB of cross-border e-commerce uh, purchases um, per year. And, and how do they know this? Uh, how does this quota apply in practice? It applies because when you buy a product on this cross-border e-commerce platforms, um, typically you will need to insert your ID number. Um, it's not just a normal, uh, or or maybe your ID number is already linked with Alipay, with WeChat, so you don't need to fill it every time. But but your ID number, in any case, is transmitted to the platform. So the platform, in turn, is transmitted to the Chinese customs and the tax bureau, so, so they know when the quota is there or not. Um, at the same time, in addition to this annual quota, there is also um, a limit on a single purchase. Every single purchase of cross-border commerce cannot exceed 5,000 RMB, which is a bit more than 600 euros. Um, so, so, um, um, so, so if, if a single purchase, you buy a product which costs 10,000 RMB, it is still within the annual quota of 26,000 RMB, but it exceeds the uh, individual purchase quota. And this has implications, uh, we will see in the next slide for, for tax reasons, but um, um, so, so basically what I'm trying to say is that, uh, when you sell these products, you have to make sure that they don't exceed this, uh, 5,000 RMB core, otherwise you will lose the preferential tax, uh, we'll see in the next slide. Um, yeah, so, so, no, actually we would see this now in this slide. So, um, cross-border e-commerce items that are within the 5,000 RMB quota, uh, enjoy a preferential tax rate. Uh, they're exempt from customs duties. You don't pay customs duty in China, and you pay VAT and eventually uh, a consumption tax, another another tax uh, for for some products only. Uh, only on seventy percent of the product of the of the value of the product, not a hundred percent. But if the product exceed the five thousand uh, RMB quota on, on the individual purchase, then the standard tax uh, rate apply. You will pay customer duty, you will pay VAT in full, you will pay consumption tax in full. Um, if um, an individual has exceeded the annual quota of 26,000 RMB, then they cannot buy the product at all. They have to buy it from other channels, uh, normal general trade channels. And um, so this means that uh, they cannot buy uh, if your product is only available on cross-border e-commerce platform and not available via general trade, then this person who has exceeded the 26,000 RMB cannot buy your product. Maybe, of course, they can ask a friend to, to buy to buy it for you, for, for them, of course. There are always ways, but um, but um, this is the requirements. Um, so yeah, it, it's not easy to exceed these limits because um, yeah, you always have friends and parents and, and grandparents who can do this for you eventually. Um, I mentioned preferential tax. So, 
So um, if the product is within this 5,000 RMB limit for each individual transaction, transaction um, the goods um, do not pay customs duty in China. This is very relevant. Um, and then the VAT is uh, levied at 70% uh, of the value of the product. Some product categories uh, also need to pay a consumption tax, which is another tax uh, usually applied for luxury goods, for cosmetics, for wine, for for goods which are not um, which are considered to be a bit more um, luxury or maybe more or harmful for 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 health. And um, but also in this way that the consumption tax is paid on is levied only on seventy percent of of the. So if um, if um, on the other hand you exceed this five thousand RMB, then you have to pay the normal taxes, the normal customs duty, the normal VAT, the normal consumption tax, and so on. Um, the, the same thing, the same taxes that you will pay on general trade. I have a small example here. What does it mean in practice? Does it really make a difference? Actually, it does. It's very significant. There's a small, uh, a simple example here. On the left, you have general trade, uh, which is the standard uh, tax rate which also applies to cross-border commerce, uh, which exceeds 5,000 RMB. And on the, on the right, you have the preferential tax for cross-border commerce goods, which do not exceed the 5,000 RMB limit. In short, um, an example of a product of a, a makeup cosmetic um, that would cost 100 RMB, um, with general trade, the final cost for the consumer would be 134.4 RMB while with cross-border commerce would be 123 remedy. So it's a very important, um, it's a very important uh, difference. And, um, and, and last I mentioned the standards and, and labels and packaging with general cross-border commerce, uh, goods sold via cross-border commerce are considered personal goods. Um, so they don't need really to comply with any Chinese technical standards or label standards or packaging standards. You don't have to modify your product sometimes for general trade. Um, for general trade, you have to comply with Chinese standards, which sometimes are different from international standards, which means that you might need to adjust your product. You might need to change the formula of your product. You might need to make some modification if it's a, a, a machine, for instance, an industrial product. For cross-border e-commerce, you don't need to do any of this. You don't need to do testing, uh, you don't need to get a certification, you don't need to do anything. Maybe you might already have done this in, in your home country. You might have a animal free certification or biological certification, uh, but um, this is another story. You, you don't have to do it again for China specifically, while for general trade you will need to do it. Original labels are permitted, original packaging is also permitted. You don't need to adjust your packaging. So this is an example. On top, um, you see um, it's a vitamin, it's a health food, which is sold via general trade. This is a German product, actually. It's sold by general trade. You see that on the packaging of the product, um, the Chinese characters are there, the Chinese labels are there, all the nutritional uh, values are there. Actually, the nutritional values, the way they are displayed, they follow Chinese standards. So, so um, changing the packaging just for this might, might not be that straightforward. On the bottom of this uh, slide, uh, we see products sold by cross-border e-commerce. Actually, this is a Slovenian product. This is um, it's still a food supplement. Uh, it's a honey kind of thing. Um, and you see it's in the original uh, packaging. Uh, the first language you see on, on top left is Slovenian, and then, and then there are other languages, but Chinese is not there. So, so you can just, you don't need to change your labels. You don't need to change your product, your packaging. You don't need to do anything. Um, on, on the right, uh, you see it's it's um, still a kind of a food supplement. There is a sticker there, uh, which is Chinese characters, but this is um, this is usually applied by uh, the the partner, the Chinese partner. Uh, maybe they stick a QR code, so because Chinese consumers like to 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 scan codes and, and access more information. Um, so so, but this is done by the Chinese partner. This is not done by 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 the exporter. So. So original packaging, original label. And um, yeah, I, I'm about halfway through uh, my presentation. Um, um, I would like to maybe take five minutes to take a few questions, one or two questions if we have already, so that, um, uh, you know, if, if anything I've said maybe it's not that was not that clear, or if you want to understand more about something, um, maybe just uh, I'll take a few questions. Now. There is one actually in the Q&A. Um, 
which I'll read it out so that everybody can, can, can hear this question. So the question is, we contact Alibaba for trying to enter their cross-border platform called Tmall Global. And they told us that we must have a company in Hong Kong to handle cash flow from the sales platform. Did you see that challenge with Tmall Global? Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> thanks for the for the for the tough question. I think um, when you when you Tmall Global offers different types of uh, stores and different types of solutions. It's not just one. So maybe depending on 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 the solution on the store that that you're looking for, they might have different requirements. But I'm, uh, but I'm. To be honest, I haven't heard this Hong Kong uh, thing to handle cash flow. But I'm pretty sure that many. Uh, what the only thing I can tell is that many European companies sell via Tmall Global without a company in Hong Kong to handle cash flow, because cash flow is actually handled by Alibaba itself. Uh, by in this case, uh, it would be uh, Alibaba, of course. Um, it's it's handled by them directly without. Then how they do it by Hong Kong, by other ways, the other markets, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, so so I don't know the answer to your question. I only I can only tell you that many companies I know uh, sell via Timo Global without a company in Hong Kong. So maybe you can try to reach out to other Chinese partners from digital marketing agencies and see maybe um, if there are other solutions. So uh, I don't know if this uh, was useful, but um there is another question which is how much time does it take to set up bonded imports um since time is a factor when balancing between direct shipment and bonded import um what's a very good question um to be honest i think um it depends it depends whether you have a warehouse that you have to find yourself you want to manage it yourself uh, so that you have to go, you know, you have to have somebody on the ground visiting different bonded zones and then discussing, selecting a warehouse. Uh, or if you choose to work with a Chinese partner, which already has all of this, and then you basically just need to, you know, sign an agreement with them, pay them some, some leasing fees some service fees, and then they do it for you. In this way, it will be very short. I don't think it will be, you just need to find a partner and reach an agreement. Then... Then you can choose, um, once you have this warehouse, you can choose the shipping method. You can sell, you can ship by, by, by sea, um, via sea, which uh, of course can take maybe you know, three or four months, uh, considering the, the issues with uh, sea freight. You can also sell uh, by a train, uh, by a plane, uh, you choose it. Um, but then the standard uh, time for, for shipping method apply. So, but uh, but the real difference is that if if you organize your your uh, your orders, um, uh, for instance, let's say uh, you know in China every year there are some big uh, e-commerce festivals, shopping festivals like Singles Day or or uh, 18 of June. There are big festivals. If you plan in advance, maybe maybe um, if you wish to do some marketing, some promotions during these festivals. Then you prepare six months in advance. You, you you prepare a shipment of a large quantity of goods so that when the shopping festival um takes place, your goods are already in the in the warehouse in the bonded zone, and then they are shipped to the final consumers um as soon as they make an order and they arrive to them in two or three days. So this is the real um advantage of this this uh, this model. Um, the final delivery time, the delivery time to the final consumers, but before the product reaches the warehouse is the standard, uh, you know, time that uh, products uh, need to be delivered to China. So I hope this answers your question. If not, please uh, send another comment. Um, I, I'll, I'll then uh, move to the next part. Uh, of course, you are, are you're welcome to submit questions anytime in the Q and A in the Q&A box or in the chat, write comments uh, and so on. So in, the, in, the, in this section, uh, we will look in more specifically into the specific uh, platforms that you can use for cross-border e-commerce. We mentioned that cross-border e-commerce is, is different from e-commerce because you cannot just sell on any e-commerce platforms. So you have to sell on specific platforms which have this cross-border, are approved for cross-border e-commerce. So 
this is another view of these platforms. Um, some of them might look or might sound familiar to you because, for instance, Timor Global, JD Worldwide, actually they are they are like the international, the cross-border e-commerce uh, sister platform of um, a bigger platform which um, already exists. Like there is Timor in China, there is Timor, there is Taobao, which are domestic, which are mostly for domestic uh, products, well, not only for the support, but therefore for general trade products, um, they have larger um, products available. And then within uh, this uh, Tmall Taobao ecosystem, you have Tmall Global. Uh, and the same applies to JD. There is JD, where you can find products which are sold via general trade. And then there is JD Worldwide, which is specifically for cross border e commerce. There are other platforms. Um, some of them um, were popular in the past, like Kaula, but now not that not that popular anymore. There are also other platforms, which you see on the bottom, which are not were not born as cross border commerce platforms. They were born as other platforms. You see Douyin, which is the Chinese TikTok uh, on the middle. Then you have uh, Little Red Book. But um, uh, despite not being uh, born as cross border commerce platform eventually over time they entered into this market so so they they offer cross border e-commerce uh, solutions i will uh, focus on on three platforms uh three of these platforms to to provide an overview oh, oh yeah this is um uh, an overview of the market shares of these platforms this data refers to quarter 3 2022 so it might be slightly outdated i expect that some changes uh, have taken places. For instance, um, Red, which is Xiao Shu or with the Red Book, I think in this chart is only 2%, but I think now it's much more than that. Maybe it's even one third or one fourth because it's increasingly, it's incredibly popular now. But um, but in any case, this chart, I think the purpose is just to tell you that Tmall Global and JD, uh, especially Tmall Global is, is the most important one for cross-border e-commerce. Um, is is um yeah it's the most important one. JD International was also very important. It is very important, but it is I think losing um against other new platforms such as Xiao Shu that I mentioned. But also Douyin, the Chinese TikTok, um is growing enormously. Um, so uh Timo Global um how does it work? Uh, Timo Global has a very large audience. We are talking about nine hundred uh, million users. Um, and the good thing is that um, Timor Global is perfectly integrated within Tmall and Taobao. So Chinese users don't need to download the different apps. Uh, they just need to use the standard Taobao Tmall uh, uh, apps that they use, and then um, they can find cross-border e-commerce products within these platforms. Another thing is that Tmall Global also offers different logistics solutions. Um, there are some solutions. Um, I mentioned that you have to open a store on these cross-border e-commerce platforms. Sometimes you don't have to do this. Sometimes you can sell your products to Tmall Global and then they will put your products into their own self-run Tmall market, uh, something like that. Um, or, or maybe another thing is that Tmall Global also has some warehouses in Europe where you can actually just need to ship your products to the warehouse in Europe and then they take care of the rest. Um, these um, are offered but uh, in practice only to brands which are bigger, are more known and already have some records in China. If you're a totally new brand, uh, probably the solutions won't work for you. You will, you will need to open your store or find a partner that has a store. Uh, Timor Global is, is the number one uh, e cross border e-commerce platforms, but it has higher requirements for um, for opening a store and it's very expensive. It's, it's probably the most expensive one. And there is also the, the, the fiercest competition uh, there. On the right here, you have some examples of the cost uh, of opening a store on Tmall. Again, there are different types of stores, but um, the basic store, first of all, you will need a security the deposit, uh, which could be from, um, you know, from, from 10, from, from, from a dozen thousand euro or to 40,000 euro or even a hundred thousand euro. It depended on the, on the, on what type of product, um, we sell. 
Um, this security deposit uh, will be eventually returned to you once you close the store, uh, if nothing, no incidents, nothing is happening in between. Then there is an annual fee, which could be 30,000 RMB to 60,000 RMB, depending on the product. Then there is a commission on transaction, transactions, which could be 0.5% to 5% of the value of the group, and depending on the product. And then there is um, the good thing about uh, Timo Global is that um, all the payments take place uh, are managed by by Alipay in this case. Uh, so so you can actually sell your product in your own currency uh, in euro. You can have a product. Uh, you can set the price in euro, and then um, the Chinese consumer buy the product in renminbi. They use their own Alipay. They pay in renminbi, and then you will receive the money in euro directly. You don't have to do anything. Alipay manages everything, uh, all of this. But of course, they apply a fee, uh, which usually is one percent of the of the transaction. Um, so, so yeah, this was an example of Timo. Um, again, it's the biggest platform, which is more expensive, but uh, it's um, it's very big. And this is to show how it works. So, so on the left we have the normal Taobao. Taobao is a Chinese e-commerce platform, not for cross-border e-commerce. But within this app, you can um, you can um, access cross-border e-commerce. We 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 tell you here how to do it, uh, but. Um, yeah, you can access it directly from this app. So consumers don't need to download a separate app for this. And uh, they can just even, they can just search a normal product and then they will see uh, different results. And among which there could be products which are uh, cross-border e-commerce product. And you will see, you see on the right, um, there is this uh, little purple kind of um, words uh, that tells that it's a cross-border e-commerce product. Um, the same thing actually applies for J Jindong, uh, for JD and JD Worldwide. JD Worldwide is a cross-border e-commerce arm of uh, JD. And um, it's, it's the same. It's completely integrated into the standard JD platforms. You, users don't need to download separate apps. Um, it's, it's the same thing like, um, um, like I showed before for Timo Global. Um, JD Worldwide, we, we, we saw in the previous slide, was the second. It has it had about 25% share. I'm not sure about the current statistics. I think it has lost uh, share uh, to Xiao Hongshu, which we will see in the next slide. But it's still very relevant. And um, and the other thing uh, about Jindong is that it also works very well with WeChat. Uh, so you can actually leverage both. You can also do some WeChat marketing and then um, for selling your products on JD, while uh, Tmall and WeChat, they are two different companies, are the two biggest competitors, so so uh, they are very separate. Okay. <laughs> um, the other thing is that JD doesn't offer um, as many solutions in terms of logistics and payments as um, Tmall. Um, they have a smaller user base. We heard from European companies that they prefer bigger brands. Um, by any case, if the costs on JD are much lower than Timo Global. And um, see, annual fee here is only 1,000 uh, 1, uh, US dollars, while for Timo Global was 30,000 RMB, so 4, 000, around 4,000 euro to 8,000 euro per year, while here is 1,000. So, so it's much cheaper, but of course, um, um, the, the user base is lower and, uh, and so on. And the last platform I wanted to introduce to you is is this one, uh, which now is also very pop is very known in Europe. But while until a uh, few years ago nobody knew about these platforms in Europe, it, it's it's called Xiao Hongshu, which is um, in English is called Red sometimes or a Little Red Book. Um, basically, it it wasn't created as a cross border commerce platform. Originally, it was a sort of Instagram kind of platform where people can just uh, share their stories or write comments. Uh, it was uh, they could get tips on you know some shopping places or tourism places, but um, but gradually it expanded and now um it has it also offers some cross border e commerce uh, options. You can also open a store on this platform and they have uh several hundred millions of users already on this. Um, it's very powerful for social e commerce. So. Um, and also for small niche brands, which are not yet in the Chinese market. Um, a lot of users of Xiao Hongshu are actually Chinese uh, who travel abroad or reside abroad or live abroad. And then they can find very niche products which are not known in China. And maybe through, through these people, you can... Um, I, I, my, my suggestion is to leverage on these people because through these people, you can get your product known in China for very little. 
I think um, now you have key opinion leaders, influencers on Seo Hong as well, but you also have uh, key opinion consumers, which are not um, yet these influencers and, and are much cheaper. I think you should uh, work uh, with this. Um, so, so basically with this platform, you can do videos and then while you have a video and um, you can, uh, there is the link that appears and uh, users can click on it and make the order and so on. And it's much uh, cheaper uh, to, to sell, to open a store on Xiao Hong Shu is, is much uh, cheaper. And um, yeah. And uh, here is an example of how Xiao Hong Shu looks like. Uh, to be honest, this, Screenshot was done last year. I don't know if it's still the same the interface, but but you see it's it's mostly um users leave comments. And it's not just standard comments like you would find on on Tmall. On it, it's really sharing of of experience. So so um so it's more kind of um let's say more personal. It has it gives more direct insight into a product and uh, and um. And last, I wanted to share something else. Um, this comes from a report that the European Union uh, financed a couple of years ago to show how EU products are sold by cross-border e-commerce in China. So around, at that time, it was 2022, at that time, uh, around, uh, let's say, 18% of China's total cross-border e-commerce cross imports were from um, came from the European Union. So it's around one-fifth of cross-border e-commerce imports were from the European Union, and um, and among this, um, a, a good percentage, I think, um, about uh, about thirty percent of uh, European cross border e commerce exports to China were agri food products, and um, while the rest um, mostly cosmetics or uh, luxury goods or um, or even some electronics some some uh, household appliances um these are typical features but it's mostly really cosmetics luxury and um uh, apparel textile and, and things like that within agri food um it's mostly baby food infant formula and health food milk um and in this chart actually health food is not included actually but um health food is one of the most popular uh, cross-border commerce categories together with cosmetics as i mentioned luxury <clears throat> and it's mostly baby food um milk butter or cookies confectionery uh chocolate this kind of this kind of uh, things and I have um, a last um, discussion point, uh, which are basically some some general recommendations, some tips that uh, are built on the experience of European SMEs we have engaged with uh, in this year. So I would say that uh, with cross-border e-commerce, entering the Chinese market via cross-border e-commerce is not particularly difficult or costly. We mentioned you just need to make sure that your product is on the cross-border e-commerce list and that you open a store or you have a partner with a store and then you put the product there. These things in practice don't take long, take maybe three weeks, uh, two or three, four, four weeks, depends, but, but not that much. And actually opening a store yourself is not that expensive. You have, of course, annual fees, you have transactions fees, but but the initial cost, um, the down, the the, the 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 initial down payments are not that big as general trade would be, because general trade, you will need to register your product. Maybe you have to do one year of testing. You have to pay Chinese inspector to visit your factory in your country. You have to play to pay for the plane ticket. You know, it's it, it's very expensive. Well, cross-border commerce is not. However, doing it well, this, this is not, just opening a store will not be enough uh, because you, you will never reach Chinese consumers. You have to spend a lot in, first of all, having a cool design of the store. You have to, present a product very well, you have to produce graphics, you have to produce content, video content, graphic content that, that presents a product very well. And you, and you need to do a lot of marketing, um, influencer marketing, KOC marketing, you have to do, you have to invest a lot. So so the initial cost of course, where the e-commerce are not, are not high, but to do it well, you will need still a lot of resources and commitments. Um, yeah, I mentioned you have to design your store, you have to work with the, with key uh, opinion leaders or key opinion consumers in China. Uh, you may do live streaming e-commerce. You have 
or you also have to uh, have other general social media presence, WeChat. Um, 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 then, then uh, in China there are a lot of uh, shopping festi online shopping festivals. Actually, um, these are very big events, and uh, you have to. Um, if you want to participate in these events, you have to do very aggressive promotions, you have to offer vouchers, so you have to actually, uh, your margins will be incredibly low because you have to offer promotions. And actually, there are many companies which actually lose money, lose money on, on big, on major shopping festivals. Right? So, so it's not just uh, earning money, but sometimes you might lose money. Of course, you gain in terms of popularity of the product, you gain in terms of brand awareness, you gain in terms of sales uh monthly sales of your product so your product uh appears higher on on the results but but on that particular occasion you, you lose money um customer service is very important chinese uh, consumers like to engage a lot with the with the uh taobao you know store they have questions they want to know more about the product or they want to know more about the logistics um you have to have a um a, a consumer customer service uh, and also an after sales uh service now you can have it dark, you can have it yourself, you can manage it yourself. Uh, possible, not that difficult, but it's it costs a lot because you know you have to have resources uh, there and available 24 seven. You can also outsource this to, to your partner. If you have a Chinese partner, they can do this for you. You can also use AI, you can use robots, but, um, but still uh, you need to have spend some resources on this on this regard. Logistics, as I mentioned, uh, you have to, um, you can manage your warehouse directly. You can uh, ask your partners to do it. In any case, it's going to cost a lot. Um, IP, actually, uh, this is a separate issue. Extremely important, you should always protect your IP trademark. You should register your trademark in China before you even go to China, because um, if the, your trademark will not be protected in China unless you register it. So. So uh, this should, you should, be, uh, actually it's very easy to register a trademark in China. It costs maybe 400 euros and it's, it's very easy. So do it. Um, this is, these are examples uh, that we actually have in our report, but um, this is a digital um, marketing agency based in China that do some live streaming marketing for, um, for, for an European brand. Uh, this is a health food. Um, this is like a cream that uh, relieves, you know, the, the, the itchy kind of um, feeling. And um, yeah, you have this live streaming, uh, you have this uh, KOC or KOL that explain the product and they sell the product. You also have uh, Shu posts. Uh, so um, this is an example of how it works and then people can engage, can write comments. Um, this is another example in this case with Czech beer. Uh, you have, um, again, this was done by a digital marketing agency on behalf of a Czech um, company. Uh, you have uh, different sessions where they sell beer and you have different people for different targets. You have on the left, you have two uh, gentlemen, very funny, you know, they're more uh, direct, they're direct, directed to, you know, maybe men. Um, uh, younger men that uh, have different um, feeling, uh, different different ways of communicating. While on the right, you have women, which maybe explain different features of of the, of the product. So you have to um, you know adapt your communication to to to, to different uh, consumer groups. Um, this is an example of uh, actually an Italian wine, and they did uh, they did very interesting stuff. Uh, they work on Douyin, so they do a lot of uh, KOL. Uh, marketing actually they invited a lot of chinese kols to go to their winery uh during the harvest season they do the harvest together these influencers were live streaming while basically um you know doing the uh you know doing the harvest so it was super cool and uh, of course it's very expensive but um you know you get the results this um this store actually has uh, i think uh, a lot of sales i think hundreds for uh, 140,000 sales. Uh, uh, anyway, this is this is an example for for still health food. Um, you see from these examples that uh, health food is is one of the main categories. Um, so if you have health food, uh, cross border commerce is, is very is very suitable for you. I mentioned cross border commerce has a lot of opportunities, but it's very hard. There is a lot of competition and. Uh, 
And there are lots of products, not only from the EU, but you also have Japanese products, Korean products, American products, Thailand, Thai products, Australian products. Competition is very fierce. So having your products there, uh, you know, invest in marketing alone is, is not necessarily enough. You have to, first of all, you have to have a quality product there. Price is also a very important factor, um, especially when you compete with other products which are much cheaper. Um, also the way your product is presented, the the the, the design of the of the store or is, is very important, and also um, the uniqueness of the product. So uh, a typical approach, um, you know, usually uh, if you're an SME, you have very limited resources. A uh, typical approach is to start from one uh, uh, cross-border e-commerce platform only. Could be Timo, could be Xiaohong Shu, but in any case, focus just on one and and uh, on one platforms and on one or two marketing strategies. Don't go all in to KOL, uh, um, KOC, and then paid advertisements. Don't, don't do all of it. Focus on one or two. Build a, a record first. Build your uh, numbers first, and then you, you scale up. Um, you also have to understand who are your target groups. Um, and then only after that, uh, maybe you can consider increasing your, expanding your strategy. A common mistake that we hear from companies that uh, sell through cross-border e-commerce is that they underestimated the resources needed. We mentioned that the initial costs of cross-border e-commerce are not that high. This is true. But to do it well, you need to invest a lot. And many people maybe allocate just very limited resources to it, and then they find out uh, they launch one or two marketing campaigns that have very, uh, they don't have excellent results. So eventually after six months, one year, they abandon their store and they just leave it there or they close it. So this is very common. Um, Cross-border e-commerce uh, cross e -commerce is expensive. Logistics, uh, you have to, again, one of the most important factors, uh, if not the most important factor, I would say uh, in China is, is the reviews, is the score that your store and your products have on this platform. So uh, these reviews um, relate often to logistics, so after sales, of course, the quality of the product, uh, of course, but, but also after sales, customer service and, and logistics. So these are aspects which are fundamental. And the wrong partners, we also have examples of European companies that they had a Tmall partner, they, they had a Chinese uh, partner that uh, managed basically their store on Tmall Global. Um, this, this was a Belgian company. They had an issue at some point with this uh, local partner because they had different, there was a mismatch of expectations. For the Chinese partner, the Belgian company was just one among many uh, foreign clients. Well, for a Belgian company, a Chinese company, the Chinese partner was was everything they had. So um, they had different expectations. The Chinese company was not that interested in 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 you know in promoting actively that product because they had other maybe products with with a higher margin with better sales. Um, and the other thing, at some point, this Belgian company uh, found out that the money they invested for marketing, uh, for promotion campaigns, didn't bring the results they expected. So they went to ask questions to this partner and um, the partner wasn't able to provide transparent data, um, you know, how this money were actually spent. There were a lot of discrepancies among the data reported and the, and the money uh, actually spent. So, so at the end, um, this budget company decided to, uh, actually take over, take everything over from this partner and do it themselves because maybe it was a more efficient way of spending money. So this is to say that um, you will most likely work with a local partner for different things, for, for uh, managing logistics, for managing marketing. You have to make sure this marketing performs well. Uh, you have to do uh, due diligence. You have to have a solid contract in place with some clauses about uh, you know uh, the, the the reporting they have, the transparency they have, the obligations they have, and also targets that they have. So um, yeah. Also, um, many people, many companies uh, we hear, especially during COVID times, where they couldn't go to China, they would say, "Okay, I cannot go to China. Let's let's do a big campaign with a big Chinese influencer, uh, key opinion leader, and then we we make a lot of money out of it." Uh, this is wrong. <laughs> Again, you don't um, usually you don't make uh, much money by we, we, by working with a key opinion leader in one single session. 
because they have um, you know very high commissions. They have usually a fixed uh, commission plus a commission on the price or on the on the sales done. Um, and the other thing is that the other thing is that um, sometimes you have to really choose the right KOL, which uh, not all KOLs are, are good for your products. Uh, they might smaller QLs with smaller user bases might be better than, than larger QLs. And and the most important thing you have to remember is that the QL also needs to benefit by working with you. QL at the end of the day uh, builds all his uh, all their work on the trust that their followers have on the QL. So if you give, if you help them increase in the trust that consumers that followers have on QLs, they uh, the QLs maybe might give you better deals, or you might have um, longer term, more stable relations, which at the end might also lead to lower um, uh, commissions asked uh, by 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 QLs. So, so again, it must be a win win kind of thing. So uh, that was a bit all uh, for, for for my side. Um, you, any questions are welcome. Um, maybe one a few words about uh, ourselves. We mentioned my colleague David at the beginning mentioned a lot of free services that we offer. We have this diagnosis tool. Um, my suggestion is for you if you're new to the Chinese market is to try this self diagnosis tool. There are a lot of tips. There are a lot of direct questions and and and. Um, and then um and then come to us if you have any doubts if you want to understand more about a particular aspect you can discuss we will be very happy to discuss with you one to one by a call uh, or by email if you prefer uh, totally free we have um totally free uh, if you have questions about how much uh, was the tax rate of a certain product or was the chinese standard for labeling of uh, pasteurized milk we we will tell you uh, we will give you the answer for free Sometimes we, we issue uh, calls for speakers to for webinars uh, or, or maybe surveys or maybe uh, we also do case studies sometimes um, about the experience of European companies. Uh, if you're interested in, in you know sharing your experience, we will very um, very very much welcome it. And um, you can also reach out to us if you have any ideas of, of topics that we could cover in specific training sessions or reports. Uh, please let us know. So yeah. This is my email. You are very welcome to also write to me or my colleague David Derek. Thank you. I give the floor to you, David. Thank you very much, Alessio, for the presentation. Uh, extremely interesting. I think it was very nice also to have uh, specific case studies from European companies that can really serve as kind of a reference in order to assess uh, how to best cope with uh, with these instruments. Uh, just a final check if there are any last questions coming uh, from the audience. Uh, I believe the, the presentation was extremely thorough already, but of course, if you have any specific questions that you would like to ask uh, that can be uh, expanding a little bit on what was covered during today's presentation, please do not hesitate to uh, post them in the Q&A uh, section of the, of the platform, or as an SEO was just saying, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, to our website. Uh, we will be more than happy uh, to cover um, cover this also in a second second moment. Uh, as Alessio is, uh, is sharing the screen for the for the survey, uh, once again, uh, please do fill out uh, the survey. We are always uh, more than happy to receive your feedback to make sure that we can ameliorate. Uh, how we carry out these activities and to uh, be able to provide the best service that we can to European-based uh, companies. I see that we have no uh, no other questions coming from uh, from the audience. So I think, uh, well, it's time for, <laughs> for me to once again uh, extend my heartfelt uh, thank you to everyone that took part today uh, at this uh, slide, you can find QR codes uh, to our LinkedIn and uh, WeChat accounts. Please make sure to follow us also uh, through these channels to be uh, kept up to date for all, all of our uh, incoming activities, uh, as well as, of course, please register on the SME Center website where you can uh, also take advantage of all the uh, documents and publications that we that we've published, as well as the self-diagnosis tool, as we said uh, at the beginning of the conference. 
uh, I would like also to uh, extend once more my uh, thank you to uh, Tinker Godek, to the uh, Slovenian Chinese uh, Business Council for co-organizing uh, this event with us, to our speaker, uh, Alessio Petino, for the uh, extremely thorough uh, presentation of the uh, cross-border e-commerce uh, opportunities and challenges uh, for what concerns the Chinese market. And with all that being said, uh, I hope you found this uh, webinar useful and that we will have the chance to uh, have you again in other activities that we are planning for the future. Thank you very much to, uh, to all of you, thank you to the speakers and uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.